Well, good morning. Well, this is the my second attempt to kick off this Facebook Live. So hopefully um, this one doesn't uh, just arbitrarily stop on its own. Um, anyway, so today we're continuing our study of First Peter. And um, we're in the middle of a section uh, about how Christians... Um, the idea of a Christian's blessing to suffer for the sake of righteousness. And, you know, when I start these, these studies, I actually prepare my notes as far as a, I mean, these notes for this video that this live this morning were actually probably finished about four or five weeks ago. And so sometimes I have to refresh, you know, my memory a little bit um, on where I am in my notes before I continue. And, you know, it's interesting. I didn't know where this was going to go when I started this study of First Peter. Um, it was something I started actually in the first week of September. And um, the Lord told me to do it, so I'm doing it, and I'm being obedient. I had no idea where it was going to go. Some of my notes are on the fly. Um, and, uh, you know, there's this thing of suffering, suffering, suffering. And then as a Christian, how do you suffer? And then how do you um, live with continued hope even in the middle of suffering? Now, I don't like this idea, the word suffering from the view of an American. I really don't. Um, I think I've shared that before because I think that our ideal of suffering depends on where it is that you live. Um, you know, so what we Americans are going through, this video is being done. I don't know when you're watching it is uh, in the middle of January of 2021. And there's a lot of stuff that is happening that is causing people to question, um, you know, their ideals and, and they're starting to question what they believe in that's even happening and the um so the ideal of christians being blessed in the middle of suffering is something that i struggle with because even with what americans are dealing with right now i believe that there are people in the world and regions such as the middle east and areas in africa examples i've used before that what we're going through doesn't even compare what it is they're going through and if they were to look at what we're dealing with right now in america um, they would probably rather have what we have still compared to what they have. So this idea of suffering is an idea of perspective. And then your perspective is going to be slanted based on other factors around your life. Now, the ideal, biblically speaking, is no matter what your perspective is, no matter what it is that's impacting your perspective, no matter what it is that you're going through, Biblically speaking, we are to continue to live in hope and feel blessed when we are being persecuted or suffered, pick your words, um, for, uh, for righteousness. And one of the things that I prayed about this morning, and it was, a very, it was a quick prayer, was this idea of righteousness. So there are people that I'm not sure if we're defining righteousness the right way. Um, and there are people that probably believe that they are righteous where other people would judge them to be unrighteous. Um, and then, you know, um, and again, based on your perspective, what it is, the degree of suffering, you know, what, how much you've been inconvenienced and things of that nature, right? Are we truly living for Christ or are we not? Are we living for ourselves or, or, or not? And um, that was a very quick two-minute download for me this morning before I started this section. So if I get a little emotional, I apologize. I can already feel it welling up. But I'm going to continue, and I am going to drive on, and we'll see, we'll see where it leads us. So today we're starting in verse 318, um, and it's the middle of a section of a letter that uh, Peter is outlining this idea of Christians' blessing to suffer for the sake of righteousness, that we need to be prepared to share with others why we still have hope even in the midst of utter chaos. What is our purpose while we walk and live on this earth? And I'm talking about Christ followers. What is our purpose while we walk and live on this earth right now on what is it, 11 January or 12 January, whatever today, January 11th, right, of 2021? What is our purpose while we walk and live on this earth? So verse 318, for Christ also suffered for sins once for all time, but the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, 
but made alive in the spirit. Christ suffered and died as the righteous one. Nobody will dispute that. In place of the unrighteous, people will dispute that, so that we, the unrighteous, right? We, the unrighteous, would be bought, would be brought closer to God. This verse covers what some refer to as the doctrine of the cross or the theology of the cross. The first points to the idea that Christ also suffered for sins once for all, which is an idea that's also pointed out in Hebrews 7, verse 27, which says, Who has no daily need like those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because he did this once for all time when he offered up himself. The verse continues, I'm talking about Peter, Peter 3.18, the verse continues with the thought that Christ suffered for our sins for all time, implying that his sacrifice has no time limit. It's infinite. Under the old covenant, Jews would sacrifice lambs, right, on a regular basis. Um, Passover is an example where every year, right, they would sacrifice these, these lambs. Um, because the covering has an expiration date, the blood would run dry. And so they would constantly have to sacrifice lambs to replenish um, the sacrifice of washing away of our sins and seeking forgiveness and those sorts of things. So the continued sacrifice of the lambs was an indicator of their continued devotion to the Lord. Um, something that is no longer required today because the sacrifice of Jesus covers all sins for the whole world for all time. You know, this thought flows into that doctrine of grace, right? As it makes working for our salvation no longer a necessary component of our faith. You know, I think that I'm guilty of this, and probably some of you are as well. I know a lot of others are, that when we're seeking grace, we perceive grace as something that has substance, um, that it's something that you can touch. It's something that you feel. Um, grace has no substance. Um, grace is not a feeling. Um, grace is not something that you can touch. Grace is a, a, an attitude of behavior, an attitude of your character. You know, I saw a meme this morning from a good friend of mine that talked about that as a tree grows, it casts a shadow. The shadow is, is not the reality of the tree that stands, but the tree represents your character, and then you have your shadow. Which one's real? The shadow is the is the... Uh, what people perceive, right? So the shadow represents what they perceive. The tree represents your character. Which one is real, right? Is the perception wrong or is the, um, or is your character wrong that's casting a negative shadow? And, um, you know, I used to tell people that whatever people have, whatever people perceive of you, you can control your perception, you know, and in today's world, I'm not, I don't know, you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm asking myself that question, is that real? Can I control what people perceive? To a degree, yes, I think we are ultimately responsible for what people perceive. But anyway, so Peter continues with his thoughts, and he points out, uh, he points about the cross with these words, the just for the unjust. Christ sacrificed himself for the unjust while he himself was the just, as a form of justice, for our own sin, for our sin. This concept of, of this just for the unjust and the act of justice is explained more in, by Paul in Romans chapter 3, more specifically verses 23 through 26, which says, so Romans uh, 3, verses 23 through 26, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness, because in God's merciful restraint, he let the sins previously committed go unpunished. For the demonstration, that is, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Believers were previously unjust, Christ followers, right? Previously unjust in their behavior, but through... Their faith in Jesus Christ, the Lord provided righteous judgment through the event of your justification. Justification being a singular event where you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. And by result, 
believers are now counted righteous. Are we? You know, and uh, that's where that we get down to the purpose of why we continue to walk on earth, right? What is our purpose for walking earth or, on earth as Christ followers? Now, this doesn't give us permission to continue to sin. Um, that would be disobedient and considered unrighteous. But lest we forget, Jesus did not die to give us permission to simply have a better day or to continue behaving the same way with the same attitudes. The righteous live their lives with a pure heart, striving to be holy, but never fully holy. Peter continues this analogy to the doctrine of the cross with his words so that he might bring us to God, which pertains to the believer's um, reconciliation with the Father. Reconciliation is something that happens by the will of God, his forgiveness of our sins, and by the obedience of our faith at the cross. The concept of reconciliation is discussed in more detail by Paul in his, in his second letter to Corinth, um, specifically 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. Reconciliation is by the will of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 18. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Gave us the God, through Christ, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You know, so perhaps it's time for some people in the world today to reconcile their faith in Christ towards trying to reconcile events of the past, trying to reconcile events of history. History is history. History is the past. Do we, are we not supposed to look in the rearview mirror and judge our past and not judge ourselves based on our past? So should we judge others based off their past? And so perhaps reconciliation, this ministry of reconciliation, we should check our hearts about reconciliating the reconciliation of our relationship with Christ rather than trying to reconcile mistakes of the past. Reconciliation is by the act of forgiveness. Second Corinthians five verse 19 says that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. If you're looking in the past and have not reconciled the past um, and have, um, then you are likely living in a state of unforgiveness, possibly. And it's something that you're going to have to check in your heart. And, and it's, a, it's a discussion and a conversation that you're going to have to have with God. So um, the uh, can you forgive and to the point of letting it go everything that happened in the past, be it 100 years ago? I'm talking about the sins of the past of the United States, the sins of the past of Congress, the sins of, of, uh, of um, good Lord, man. I'm going to go there. I'm going to go there. If you are a follower of Christ and did not like Trump as president, can you forgive him now, today, for anything that you struggled with him while he was serving in office as president? You know, Christ would say, yes, that you need to forgive Trump for whatever it is, whatever it is that you think that he slanted against you. Or are you looking for him to be judged while he is still on this earth rather than letting him be judged by the Lord when he is standing in the throne room in front of God. What is reconciliation if you cannot let it go? Reconciliation happens by the obedience of faith. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. Right? Uh, be reconciled to God because it is the will of God, right? That he gave you the ministry of reconciliation. The act of uh, reconciliation is an act of forgiveness. Can you forgive the past? Can you let it go? And um, we implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. God above all. If God is unhappy with Trump or any of the politicians that are in office or any of the people that misbehaved, and I'm guilty of this, I'm guilty of this. 
then we need to let it go because God has already forgiven them, supposedly, if they've, re if they've repented. But even if they have not repented and sought forgiveness, is it not our responsibility as Christ followers to forgive everything that happened in 2020? Is it not our job as Christ followers to let it go? And that's a struggle. And it's something that I'm struggling with right now because there are issues that still kind of raise my flesh, right? <laughs> you know, Paul talks about the thorn in the flesh, right? That's the, t the temptations that impact us every day. But we are to be reconciled to God. And if we're to be reconciled to God, then we have to learn how to forgive. And we forgive what? Everything. Why? Because Christ died for us and forgave everything. So how can God forgive sins and be just? 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become that somebody else is going to suffer. Let the justice system do what the justice system does. But can you forgive to the point where you can just let it go as you continue your walk with Christ? Um, and if you're not, then are you operating in a state of righteousness with God? You know, bottom line is that the believer is now at peace with God and no longer alienated from him. We have been reconciled, meaning that we have reconnected, right? The final idea that Peter shares in 3.18 regarding the doctrine of the cross is the fact that Jesus became human so that it would be impossible that he could die. I'm sorry, so that it would be possible he could die because if he was operating in a divine state, then he couldn't die, right? So he had to become human so that it was made possible that he could die. He was put to death in the flesh by this evil world, the physical realm, so that he could be made alive in the spirit through the role and connection of the Holy Spirit in the heavenly realm. Some translations capitalize the word spirit to emphasize the dominant role of the Holy Spirit in this passage. Peter continues in 319, in which he, Jesus, also went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison. Starting with verse 19 through verse 22, uh, we, begin, we begin to enter into an area of scripture uh, that some consider, many consider, to be the most difficult passage to interpret. Um, for me, I'm not sure that I found it that difficult. I think there's other passages that were more difficult, but we'll see. We'll see where this takes us. You know, it's, it's a difficult passage, but I would personally consider the book of Revelation to be more challenging due to the degree of symbolism and analogies that's used in there. But either case, this portion of the letter digs deeper into the suffering of Christ on the cross as it relates um, to the believer's proclamation of faith as discussed in 3.15. So you have to go back to the last video session about that. Uh, believers who suffer need to be ready to make a defense and testify about their faith. So what is the deal with spirits in prison? You know, there's quite a bit of debate about this, and I, I found differing opinions in commentary uh, between, say, the CSB, the ESV, the New King James, the MacArthur body, Crossway, Holman. Um, however, we do need to continue into verse 20 as we look up for help with the answer of the question of spirit in prisons in verse 319. These spirits... Uh, could be those who were disobedient and died in the flood during the times of Noah. In 3.18, Peter mentions that Christ was in the spirit, which in this manifestation continues through to the end of verse 20. So he's in the spirit in 3.18, and he's in the spirit through the end of verse 20. Christ was in spirit during the flood and preached through Noah, further implying that it was Jesus' proclamation in the spirit to those Noah was attempting to reach before the rain came and before the floods happened. So, but as, as, as these unbelievers in the time of Noah heard the good news, but they still chose to disobey, they were now suffering God's judgment in prison. In 2 Peter 2, verse 5, Peter refers to Noah as a, as a herald of righteousness, which means he was preaching, uh, which means that Jesus was preaching, uh, or I'm sorry, that Noah was preaching. In 1 Peter 1, verse 11, Peter mentions the Spirit of Christ operating through the Old Testament prophets which supports the argument that the Spirit of Christ could have been operating through Noah. So finally, Noah was being persecuted as part of a minority of believers, which is also similar to Christians during the time that Peter was writing this letter to the people that were exiled in, in, in Turkey, in areas of Turkey. 
um, as God saved Noah, God is also expected to save current believers as well. So another idea considered by theologians, um, the Holman CSB, for example, is that the spirits in prison are some of the fallen angels or even angels or evil angels who were currently in confinement. Um, not all demons are bound to this, to this abyss, using scriptural word, right, into this prison. Um, and you can f see a reference to that in Luke, in Luke 8.31. However, the problem with this interpretation comes in the form of a question. Is why would Jesus not have proclaimed victory to all of the fallen angels, not just to a grouping of them, the grouping of them that were in prison? So why not would he proclaim victory to all, whether they were in prison or not? Um, the third idea considered is that the spirits in prison are the sons of God that are referenced in Genesis 6, verses 1 through 4, who many believe were angels and were to cohabitated with daughters of men. Um, but this doesn't seem likely as, as Jesus compares the resurrection of the dead to angels in Matthew 22, verse 30, who gave no gender and they did not marry. Um, so based on scripture as a whole, in, I, in, in my interpretation, I believe that the spirits in prison is a reference to those who were disobedient in the times of Noah and were already dead at the time of Jesus' sacrifice. Um, if we read verses 18 through 20 carefully, it seems to me that Jesus visited these spirits in prison and proclaimed victory to them while they were there in prison, after his resurrection, but before he ascended to heaven. The Greek word for prison is phulaki. Uh, P-H-U-L-A-K-E, which means a place where someone is watched, guarded, or kept in custody. So poetically speaking, uh, Peter was referencing hell um, or the abyss where demons and the souls of wicked men are consigned. And so thus, you know, another reason why we must sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts, which is a reference to, to First Peter 3.15, is that our preaching might be authentically Jesus operating through us. In 1 Peter 3, verse 20, um, hey Steve, who once were disobedient with the patience of God, waiting in the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight people, were brought safely through the water. The spirits in prison are those who were disobedient to God as he patiently operated through Noah to preach to them while he built the ark in preparation for the flood, a time that most theologians agree was at least 100 years, right? That it was about 100 years from the time that he started building the ark until it was finished and the flood came. So the reference to the patience of God in the days of Noah, as reflected in the time that Peter wrote this letter, is a great example of how God operates to warn sinners over long periods of time. God gives you a long period. Imagine 100 years. The Lord is warning you for 100 years, <laughs> right? And after a while, I said, okay, I think we've spent enough time. I'm kind of trying to be a little bit humorous there. But um, he doesn't try to get our attention just one time or three times. He tries to get our attention throughout our entire lifetimes. Could you imagine having a vision from God or a mission from God that lasts 100 years? We can barely survive one. We could barely get through two, though there are, there are examples of generals that have operated their entire lives, 40 years, 30 years, and that sort of thing, right? I'm talking about, uh, you know, the people that we call generals of the modern age. Um, but good Lord, 100 years. We could barely go on for two or three. Um, anyway, eight people were saved through the water, and now baptism now saves you through the resurrection of Jesus Christ idea of baptism. The eight people were not saved by the water, but they were saved through the water. The water served as judgment for the disobedient during the flood. It didn't save the disobedient any more than it saved the eight people on the ark, uh, but the ark did remain afloat during the flood. Um, so what could have been a disaster for those eight people ended up becoming a means of salvation because of the ark. And so as the water from the flood served as judgment for the disobedient, Jesus' death serves as God's judgment on sin. So as the ark served as the salvation for the eight people on board the ark, 
Jesus' sacrifice serves as salvation for believers to this day. So the word corresponding at the end of verse 21 is the Greek word antitudpon, which is where we get the term antitype, which means corresponding to. It's a counterpart or it's a representation. The flood corresponds to or represents Christian baptism, or if you per prefer, Christian baptism represents the flood. So just as with the flood, the water in baptism doesn't save anyone. Doesn't save anyone. But just as the ark saved the people through the water, baptism is symbolic of the death of Jesus on the cross, which is the act that saves people to this day. So this is why Peter reminds us that baptism saves us not because it removes dirt from our bodies, but as an appeal to God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the act of baptism itself does not save. It's because of our faith of his action on the cross, which is symbolized by the water that saves. You know, baptism saves you because it represents inward faith as evidenced by one's appeal to God for the forgiveness of sins so that I may have a good conscience. And... Um, Belief that sins are forgiven through the death of Christ and the believer's act of faith through the act of baptism is the answer of a good conscience. So this is why many link baptism as the moment of one's faith um, as symbolic of a, perfect, of a person's salvation. The, the early church in particular um, strived to perform baptism as soon as possible after believers chose to believe in the gospel as indicated in Acts 2 verse 38. I know people that will wait years before they get a baptism. Why? I don't know. I don't know. Why do they wait years? You know, the early church, they, they would do it the that day. They would do it the next day. They would do it within a, matter, within a matter of a week. We have people that will wait a year. I don't understand that. In Acts 2, verse 38, I'm one of those, by the way. I think mine was like a year later. I did it with my youngest son, Seth. We got baptized at the same time. But mine was about a year later. In Acts 2, verse 38, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So regardless of your denomination, all Christians generally believe that water baptism is an outward sign of an inward reality of regeneration, which is the result of the work of the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit is regenerating you on the inside. And something is only received by grace through faith. I'm just trying to catch my breath. So in verse 22, uh, 322, Peter says, continues his thought. Who is at the right hand of God? He's talking about Jesus. Having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. The bottom line up front message of this entire section of this letter is that Jesus has triumphed over his enemies and is now ascended to heaven in his place of eminence, uh, honor, majesty, uh, authority, and power. So Jesus right now is sitting at the right hand of God in heaven with all things being subjected to him. And it's in this regard that all believers will ultimately reign with Christ. So that concludes this section. And it's going to conclude for the day. And I would encourage you, if you came into this late, um, that you watch the beginning. Because I think that the part that matters the most uh, for us today in January of 2021 and the stuff that's happening to us is this perspective of reconciliation. Um, that was the one that hit me the most as I was reviewing my notes in preparation for this meeting. So I would encourage you to go to the beginning and really meditate and ponder on the idea of reconciliation. All right. Amen. And uh, anyway, have a blessed week. And uh, remember to continue to rock on for Christ. All right. Have a blessed.